Thank you so much for coming, and thank you to Brian and Roy for hosting this fantastic WinX event. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be up here speaking to you today. As Brian said, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the on-duty death of my husband, <clears throat> whom his name is John Petropoulos, and uh, he was a Calgary police officer up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, I'm going to start today's presentation a little bit, uh, just talking a little bit about who John and I were as individuals and who we were as a couple, because that played a tremendous role, obviously, in me determining how I was going to move forward um, after his death. Um, so we met like any good Albertans did in the 90s. We got drunk in a bar at the age of 20, and the rest is history. And um, we did. We had, we had a great time. We were together for 12 years, so we were uh, dating for four years, and we were um, uh, living together for four years, and then we were married for four years. And the four years that John um, was a police officer was the same four years that we were married, just to give you a little bit of context. So it took John eight years to become a police officer. That was totally his dream. He told me that basically when we first started dating. He knew he wanted to become a police officer. So he was a determined guy. He applied to every police service across Canada pretty much and got rejection after rejection after rejection. He was like a bobo doll, like bam, 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 and he just kept bouncing up again. And what he did is he just kept bettering his application. He just got his criminology diploma, then he got his criminology degree, and he worked as a corrections officer, he delivered bread, he did what he had to do to pay the bills and keep bettering his application. His dream finally came true in 1996. He got the call from the Calgary Police Service, and we were living actually in uh, British Columbia at the time. Now, John was this big, hairy Greek guy, very handsome guy, but he was six foot three, about 200 pounds. And when he got the call, he uh, heard the, the, the message on the answer machine, and this was totally un uncharacteristic because he was this totally calm, cool, collected. Um, you know, real stoic, real police officer kind of personality. Um, you know, really quite quiet and introverted, and didn't, didn't say too much usually. Anyways, he got the call. He was so excited, he dropped to his back, and he's lying on the floor with his arms and legs in the air. I did it! It was so cute. Anyways, he, he, he'd, he'd had that moment of achieving his dream. So we were living in British Columbia, so we moved back to Alberta. And away we went. We were married that same year, 1996, so we were married for the four years, and he was a police officer. Now... Um, <laughs> what I should say, what I was doing those during those eight years was, um, I too had a dream, I wanted to become a writer, and um, I make sort of light of it, but the reality was I wrote, uh, I thought a lot about writing, I complained a lot about not having um, the my time or money to write, um, I wrote, read books on writing, I took courses on writing, I did everything except for to get my butt in the chair and actually do the writing. And John was really supportive and encouraging, I mean the poor guy had to listen to me whinge write about this for eight, actually to, for 12 years. He was did everything he could to encourage me and my potential as a writer, and I sort of just didn't take it very seriously. So in those four years back in Calgary as a married uh, couple, I started to make rumblings about starting a family because we were, you know, in our early 30s. And John said, well, okay, maybe, maybe we will start a family, but what about your writing? And I said, well, maybe I can do both. And still very much wanting to be a writer, but not willing to put the work in. And John's personality was changing. I think many people in this room will probably... Um, know a little bit when a police officer is new on the job they do have a bit of a personality change at times he was getting tougher and bitter and jaded and sure as heck wasn't too keen about bringing a child onto this planet and uh, that's sort of where we were at <laughs> September 2000 um, so we went down to California because uh, we had a Disney a wedding in Disneyland to go to which ended up being amazing we, we had a, we had a really really good trip um, we had fantastic sex in Vegas, and we um, went to the Grand Canyon, and we had a hoot at Disneyland. There was no other heck way I'd get John to Disneyland other than because he had to be there for a wedding. We went on all the rides. We had a ride. It was a really good trip. We didn't talk about work. We didn't talk about his work, my work. Uh, we didn't talk about me not writing, starting a family, anything like that. It was the old John and Marianne back. We had the trip of a lifetime. And it turned out to be extremely significant. So we came back home, and this is um, uh, sort of late September 2000, and then the poop hit the fan, and my mom called and said, um, would you like to, or not would you, that's not my mother, my mom said, would you please have Thanksgiving dinner for 15 people? And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> well, I think we're both working, mom, but I'll see what John has to say. Well, <laughs> John didn't have very much to say about that. He says, you just don't get it, do you? And I'm like, what? Uh, and so this is uh, Monday night. We get home, and, and Tuesday night, the call comes in from my mom. And I said, well, come 
come on, it's, it's Thanksgiving dinner. I said, we can make it happen. He says, we're both working. I said, actually, I'm off on Thanksgiving, dinner, uh, Thanksgiving day. And he says, Marianne, you know, when are you going to start to say no to other people and when are you going to start to say yes to things you really want to do, which is supposedly your writing? And I'm like, you're being a jerk. And he's like, okay. So you know what he did? I couldn't believe this. Uh, he gave me the silent treatment. Never happened before. We had two or three days in our house, this be big, beautiful house that we may or may not have filled with children, had our dog, and we weren't due to go back to work until the end of the week. So John was going to start back to shift on Thursday night at 9 p.m., and I started back to work on Friday morning. So here we are rattling around in this big house. Our dog's going, looking at us like, what the heck's going on? And finally, Thursday afternoon rolls around, September 28th, and John says, let's go to the dog park. And I'm like, big of you talking to me again. So we go, and I've had time to think, right? So I, uh, I'm at the dog park, and I take a deep breath, and I say, John, uh, <laughs> I am so scared. I'm going to wake up 25 years, 20 years from now and still not have finished writing a book. And you know what he says to me? He looks at me, and he says, probably right about that. As long as you know that'll have been your choice. You're a dink. We're supposed to be. <laughs> We're supposed to be making up. Pardon my language. We're supposed to be making up. And you know what he does? He throws back his head and he laughs. He says, "You're right. I am being such a jerk." That was our last conversation. I took him to work that night. Dropped him off at the uh, Calgary Police Service District Six, which is in the south part of the city where we lived. He goes into the building, and just before he goes in the back door of the police station, he turns around and gives me this little wave. No big romantic, you know, I love yous or anything like that. Just a little wave goes into the uh, door, and I drive home, and I think on the way home, I thought, geez, he's acting funny. I think I'm going to uh, figure out what he's trying to tell me here about this writing business. So I say to myself, I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. and um, set my alarm for 5 a.m. and do a little bit of writing before going into work. In those days, I worked for the Calgary Police Service as a civilian. I was uh, uh, records in records, and I took the incident reports from police officers um, over the phone, right? So I wore the little headsets and I sat in the, in the cubicle and I took in the instant reports. So I was supposed to work at 7 a.m. that morning, so I set my alarm for 5 a.m. Anyone here can guess what I did when the alarm went off at 5 a.m.? Snooze. Ten minutes passed, wake up, starting to feel a little anxious, disappointed in myself, but of course then the usual crap begins in the head. I'm too tired to go, I don't want to write, um, I have to go work for 10 hours, uh, tomorrow, 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 right? You know, the usual habit stuff. So finally roll, uh, roll out of bed around 6 a.m., go to work, I do not turn on the radio. I get to work and of course it's shift change, right? And it's rather quiet in there, but I don't really pick up on it. So I get in there and my supervisor looks at me and says, Marianne, can I see you in my office, please? And I said, sure. So I go, and she shuts the door behind me when I go in, and I think, oh, I've screwed up on a report before going on holidays. And she says, John's fallen. And I'm like, oh, you know, a broken arm, broken leg, one ear goes in one ear out the other. I don't really think too seriously about it. And she looks at me a little funny, and she says, you need to call his inspector. And I said, oh, an inspector, I say. Boy, inspectors don't usually phone in police reports. I am really screwed up on a report. And it's not until I sit down, and I'm dialing, hey, John's inspector, and I'm in, you know, I'm in with my supervisor, and, and my brain makes that connection between John's inspector, John's fall, and that starts to arc in my brain going, oh my God, some, something's happening here. So the inspector answers the phone and says, Marianne, are you with your supervisor? I say, yes. Marianne, are you sitting down? I say, yes. And uh, he says, John's fallen and hit his head. So the severity goes up a notch, right? So I'm like, okay, and I'm just sort of breathing. It feels sort of like the air in the room has been sucked out at this point. And he says, be with your supervisor. She will take you out to the back alley. Myself and John Sargent will come and pick you up. So it's exactly what we do. And we're standing in the back alley, and I've got my little lunch bag, my little purse. I'm only 32. I feel like I'm about four years old, right? Really young, really scared, really vulnerable. And I stand there, I look at my supervisor, and of course she's a Calgary Police civilian. She and everybody else in the Calgary Police knows this is huge. Officer down, word spreads like wildfire, you all know that. I don't quite know exactly how serious this is, but I can tell where we're headed. And so I look at her and I say, I am so glad we had such a good vacation. And she just throws her arms around me, because she knew. She knew where I was headed. So get in the car, Sergeant and uh, John Sergeant Inspector, pick me up, take me to the hospital. First stop is this quiet room. But, sorry, on the way to the hospital, I should just mention, by that point I knew that John had fallen through a roof. That's what they were calling it, a roof, and hit his head. That's about all we knew at a warehouse. So I get there uh, into the quiet room, and I'm sitting with John's um, partner that evening, a police, um, policewoman named Lil. And I'm sitting there, and she puts her arm around me, and then there's all John's other teammates around, quite a few of them um, male police officers. And we're sitting there, and it's just this weird, quiet moment where I'm kind of waiting to hear the next bit of news, right? So I'm sitting there, and I look up. <laughs> Lil's got her arm around me. I look, and there's all these male police officers, all these police officers looking at me, and I can tell they've been crying. And I'm like, 
oh, that's an anomaly. Cops don't cry on the job. I knew right then and there, wordlessly, quietly, gently, he's not going to make it home. And he didn't. And sure enough, the doctor comes in, tells me John's uh, suffered a massive, massive head injury. The brain is hemorrhaging, but they can only do so much because obviously it's encased in the skull. A few minutes later, a social worker comes, gets me, takes me to the emergency room. And I'm obviously collapsing inside by this point, but holding it together on the outside, what do you do? So the emergency room doors open, and I see John lying there, and he actually looks not too bad. I mean, he's, um, he's yeah, he's lying on stainless steel gurney, and he's got tubes coming out of him, and he's draped in a sheet. But, um, you know, he just kind of looks like he's sleeping. There's just a little blood on one elbow, right, because the injury's here. So he's lying there. So I'm thinking, maybe this is all going to turn around. So I run over, and I grab his hand, and I'm like, John, John. And, of course, nothing, right? The guy's going to be legally declared brain dead within three hours. So I kiss him on the lips, and I'm like, John, I love you. And that's it. My silent treatment was reinstated. That's what I say, because that was it. So the social worker puts his arm around me, gently takes me out of that emergency room into the hallway that, of course, is filling up with police officers very quickly. So before I go back to the hospital in a moment just to tell you what else happened, I want to take you guys gently out of that emergency room and explain to you how we got there because from an oh and perspective, a lot of things went wrong. And here's what happened. John had responded to a call, 5 a.m. with Lil Hall. They'd responded, the first employee of the day had called 911, and here's why. He had arrived at this warehouse, and he had seen, he'd gone to go into the door, but he'd sit with, you know, the man door, but he'd seen the, like, the, where the vehicle door was, there was a glass window over top, and there was a hole in that window. So he sees that, thinks, that's weird. Then he opens the door, and the alarm goes off. Not loud, but it sounds funny. The alarm sounds funny, and that's what, what, what he maintained. He's positive he heard. So he puts two and two together, thinks he hear, thinks that someone's in the building. Fair enough, he calls 911. Police arrive, John and Lil arrive, hear the details. They, too, agree. Agree. Okay, this could be a B and E in progress. They call for backup. They call K9. They call um, John Sargent, the boss, and the other team members come. Everyone comes, thinks that's a great, ooh, great call. You know, B and E progress. There's someone in the building. So the K9 arrives, gets the dog, and looks around the group of police officers that have assembled. Looks straight at John and says, "You, let's go." Not a moment's hesitation. Why? Because Darren Leggett had trained. John in recruit class, just like Brian Willis has. He knew that John knew how to clear buildings, plus John had just been six months on the B&E detail. So he chose John to go in the building. So K9, obviously, and the dog stay on the main level, and John goes up this uh, ladder, this uh, wooden ladder, up to the mezzanine level. So he takes, goes up there, and he's standing on about a five by five um, landing, we'll say, and then there's another ladder there with uh, more storage stuff up there. And so it was deemed a permanent workplace. People did go up there on a regular basis. So John goes up there. He's standing on this five-by-five five ladder. He takes a step from a safe surface over some very low-lying conduit wires like this to what looked like a safe surface, but it was not. It was the top of a false ceiling. There was no safety railing in place to warn him or anyone else of the danger. He takes the step. Whoop, falls through nine feet, falls into the lunchroom below. Unbelievably, someone the day before had left uh, a chair in uh, the middle of the lunchroom, so the back of John's legs hit the top of the chair, projecting his body backwards, the back of his head hitting the ground, the concrete, with enough force and angle to cause a massive brain injury right like that. Nine foot fall. That's how fast it happened. So, uh, a few other things from an oh and perspective that did go wrong was there was actually a safety rail, a safety, um, what do you call it, like a hazard sign, a warning sign. It was a good 15 feet past the actual hazard in the dark. There was no sensor lighting. John wouldn't have been able to see it. And uh, it was hanging from the roof, so it was quite high up there. So that did not a lot of good. The other thing is, too, uh, there was <laughs> that overhead uh, hole in the bay window that the person had seen actually had been caused by someone the employee the day before had driven in with the forklift, caused that, had, been, had not been communicated to the first employee of the day, so then they were thinking there was someone in the building. It was the wind going through the hole um, in that, um, yeah, the wind going through the hole that had called, caused the false alarm to go off. Security had attended, attended a couple of times. So a lot of things, unfortunately, <laughs> did go wrong. The main thing that we focused on, I'll get to that in just a moment, was that there was no, um, no safety railing in place, when according to Alberta Health and Legislature, in Alberta safety and legislation, there should have been. So, uh, when John fell through, I should mention Darren Leggett, the, the uh, canine officer, saw him fall through that, uh, immediately found him, God knows how, in the dark, but he found him in the lunchroom, immediately started CPR, which meant that John could be on life support for the day, so I could spend the day with him, holding his hand and saying goodbye to him, and also it meant that John could donate his um, heart, pancreatic islets, and his kidneys for organ donation. 
So <laughs> that's how I spent September 29th, 2000. It was the toughest day of my life, but I took John to the finish line. Um, so there we go. I go home at the end of that horrific day and wake up the next morning, 32-year-old widow, and I sort of put one foot in front of the other and do the best I can. Two weeks later, my brother comes downstairs, finds me sitting at my computer, and I'm just type, 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 typing away with my own little uh, earphones on. He's like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm writing John's story. I have heard what he told me about putting my writing a priority, and I did. It took me eight years to get that book and me where it needed to be, but I did it, and I'm under the 20-year timeline, I'd like to say, <laughs> in case John's listening. <laughs> but I, I did it. Now, from a workplace safety perspective, right after John's death, the um, recruit classmates, um, Cliff O'Brien, Glenn Laird, Joel Matthews, some of the uh, three of uh, good friends of John's from recruit class, they called crap on this just like I did. John's death was an easily preventable death at an unsafe workplace as a result of a fall. So what they did, they didn't know where we were going to go with the memorial fund, but what they did is they had the courage and the insight to do, raise little, uh, do little pins. I've got some on the back there with uh, John's uh, regimental number on them. Before John was even buried in the ground on his funeral, they raised over $10,000 and they said, Marianne, when you are in some sort of semblance of mental and emotional shape, which I wasn't at for a while, uh, would you like to be involved with how the funds are used? And I said, oh, you betcha. So eventually, you know, I'd say about after three to four months when I was sort of feeling um, up to it, we talked about how we're going to um, use that money. And what we decided to do was address the issue that led to John's death. So what we do is we raise public awareness about why and how to ensure people's workplaces are safe for everyone, including emergency responders. We also do traffic safety. So we did five public service announcements, TV ads that have aired about two, two million times on television. We have a powerful 10-minute safety video. We do presentations like this. There's a whole team of speakers that do these presentations at safety conferences. We go out into the public, into schools, conferences, and we teach people this was a preventable death. Here's what you can do to help make sure nothing like this happens um, to, your, to your own employees or to emergency responders who will not be aware of the hazards in your workplace. So from today's theme, what's important now, I'm going to do a quick little play-by-play post-game analysis of well, the story I just told you on what's important now. Of course, I didn't have what's important now and Brian Willis's voice in my head back in 2000, but I certainly do now when I look at, I look at um, you know, the things we did apply. Uh, what's important now too. So number one, ICU. When I was faced with the most horrific thing that ever could have happened to me, my greatest fear, my worst fear, losing my husband, my soulmate, my best friend, I had no training for that, obviously, but I did what I had to do. I listened to my gut and my soul and my heart and I spent the day with him. I told him whatever I needed to tell him and I had that, you know, I had that special day with him. Number two, um, I heard what John was trying to tell me about my writing. And I did. I became a writer. Boy, did I get that message loud and clear. I get my butt in the chair pretty much each and every day. I write books and screenplays and play scripts and blogs. Number three, we did not accept John's death. Uh, well, of course, yes, emotionally, yes, we accepted John's death, but we didn't accept that there was nothing we could do about that. So we went with the Memorial Fund and said, look, if we can try and transform this death into some sort of this horrific loss we've all experienced into some sort of positive change for other people and help raise awareness about emergency responders out there and the, peop the, the things that people can do to help make sure they get home to their family safe at night, that is worth it, and that's what we did. Number four, um, Darren Leggett. What's important now, he was trained to do CPR. When he needed to do it most, he was ready. Bang, he did it, and the ramifications were huge. Number five, the police officers that started John's Fund. Absolutely incredible. I don't know <laughs> how they knew what to do, and I'm still not quite sure why they stuck by my side so much. They went way above beyond the call of duty, and uh, decade, I mean, one of them is still involved, very active with the Memorial Fund, and we're pushing 17 years now, um, but the other two stuck out for 10 and 15 years collectively, and then we've got new police officers on board, right? So it's pretty extraordinary those police officers stepped up to the plate and um, said, agreed with me that said, you know, there is something we can do here. That was an easily preventable death, so that's pretty much what I wanted to uh, share with you today. And my final message, because time's up, is um, it's not what happens to us, right, that matters nearly as much as how we choose to respond. Because in any given moment, we have, we have our choice. And that's why what's important now is so important, because we can really take each step forward. But my final point is this. When we say what's important now, obviously we're asking ourselves this question, correct? So one of the 
the problems that I have found is you've got your monkey mind, your conscious mind going, blah, 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 go for the fourth, fifth, sixth beer. Pay attention to the phone instead of your kid playing. All that other stuff, right? What's important now, often the loud, the loud voices in the room. What I challenge you today is what's important now, perhaps sometimes it's the quiet guy in the room, the introspective. You can call it the soul, your intuition, your higher self, your gut, your conscience. Doesn't matter what it is, but sometimes the voice that isn't quite so loud, sometimes those are the ones, that's the answer you need to hear. And I think that... Myself included, that's is what, uh, listening to that is what will get us where we need to go. One easy, no, one simple, but not easy step at a time. Thank you very much.